finish the record of my father Mormon. Therefore I will write and hide up the records in the earth. And whither I go, it mattereth not. For I am alone. My father hath been slain in battle, and all my kinsfolk, and I have not friends, know whither to go. Over 400 years have passed away since the coming of our Lord and Savior. Now I make not myself known to the Lamanites, for they put to death every Nephite that will not deny the Christ. And I will not deny the Christ. Wherefore I wander, whithersoever I can, for the safety of mine own life. And blessed be he that shall bring this record to light, for it shall be brought out of darkness unto light, and it shall be done by the power of God. I speak unto you as if ye were present, and yet ye are not. But behold, Jesus Christ hath shown you unto me, and I know your doing. And I would exhort you that ye would come unto Christ, and be perfected in him, and deny yourselves of all ungodliness, and love God with all your might, mind, and strength. Then is his grace sufficient for you. And now I bid unto all farewell. I soon go to rest in the paradise of God until my spirit and body shall again reunite and I am brought forth triumphant through the air to meet you before the pleasing bar of the great Jehovah the eternal judge of both quick and dead. Amen. In 1827, an event prophesied for centuries took place in western New York State. Its coming had been prayed for by numerous ancient Christians. Its occurrence had been spoken of by Jesus Christ himself. It was the coming forth of one of the most important messages ever prepared by God for man. Nearly all of its contents have been carefully written over a period of centuries by prophets of God who were personal witnesses of Jesus Christ. Prophets who had been visited and tutored by angels and translated beings. Their writings were compiled and condensed, and the resulting record was revealed in the 19th century by an angel of God. It was on the evening of September 21st, 1823, Moroni, 
an ancient American prophet appeared as a resurrected messenger sent from the presence of God to deliver a message to a young man named Joseph Smith. He said there was a book deposited, written upon gold plates, giving an account of the former inhabitants of this continent and the source from whence they sprang. He also said that the fullness of the everlasting gospel was contained in it, as delivered by the Savior to the ancient inhabitants. Four years of preparation followed. Then, during the early hours of September 22nd, 1827, Joseph left his father's home in rural Manchester and traveled two miles to a nearby hill. Here, by divine appointment, the sacred record passed from immortal to mortal hands. The work of translation, a miracle wrought by the gift and power of God, commenced in a small three-room dwelling in Harmony, Pennsylvania, and culminated in the log home of Peter Whitmer Sr. near Fayette, New York. And now, after centuries of effort and sacrifice, we are the recipients of a priceless spiritual treasure. I told the brethren that the Book of Mormon was the most correct of any book on earth and the keystone of our religion. And a man would get nearer to God by abiding by its precepts than by any other book. The Lord has been operating for centuries to prepare the way for the coming forth of that book from the bowels of the earth to be published to the world, to show to the inhabitants thereof that he still lives and that he will, in the latter days, gather his elect from the four corners of the earth. The Book of Mormon cost the best blood of the 19th century. Many years ago, a young man gave up all he possessed in a search for truth that finally led him to the Book of Mormon. His name was Parley P. Pratt. In the spring of 1830, I was married and settled in a small home in the midst of a clearing made with my own hands near the Black River in Ohio. It was a beautiful, quiet place with a garden, thriving orchard, and fields of grain. About this time, my brother William, whom I had not seen for years, came to visit. My little brother, I am impressed. When we were together last, you had nothing. And now look at this. It will be difficult to leave it all. Leave it? What? past several months, the Holy Spirit has wrought so powerfully on me, I can't rest. The scriptures, William, the prophecies, you've read them. Important things are coming. I feel I have to devote my time to enlightening my fellow man and in warning them to prepare for the coming of the Lord. As a minister? No, I don't have any authority. I doubt anyone has. See, that's the great missing link, William, the authority to minister in holy things. But I feel duty-bound to enlighten mankind so far as God has enlightened me. If I had 50 acres of land, comfortable house, fields of grain, beautiful garden, fine orchard, I'm sure I would stay and enjoy it while I lived. The world might go on its merry way for all I care. You've toiled for years to obtain this. Why not enjoy it? Whoever shall forsake houses and lands for my sake shall receive an hundredfold and life everlasting. Are those the words of Jesus Christ? I believe the Bible part. I wouldn't dare believe it literally. I feel called upon by the Holy Ghost to forsake my house and home for the gospel's sake. I plan to rely on the Lord's promises. If you think they are false, 
If I'm sustained, they are true. Godspeed, brother. We parted. He to his business, I to my preparations for a mission which would only end with my life. In August 1830, I sold my farm, completed my arrangements, and we bid adieu to our wilderness home, never to see it afterwards. you'd gone to bed. I had. And then I discovered I was missing a husband. I need to leave the boat and stop a while in this region. Why? I don't know. But the spirit has plainly manifest that much to me. Go to our friends in Albany. And I'll come soon. How soon? I'm not sure. I have something to do here in this region. Exactly what or how long it will take me, I just don't know. But I'll come when it's finished. I took leave of her and of the boat and early the next morning walked ten miles into the country. Good day, sir. Well, good morning to you, stranger. I stopped to breakfast with a Mr. Wells and proposed to preach in the evening. He kindly accompanied me through the neighborhood to visit the people and circulate the appointment. A Baptist deacon, name of Hanlon. He's a good soul. Sit, sit, Isaac. How are you, Thomas? Fine. Isaac, this is Mr. Pratt from Ohio. He's on his way to Albany. Albany? You're a bit off the beaten path, aren't you, boy? Mr. Pratt is a preacher of sorts. In fact, he will be preaching at my home this evening. He'll join us, won't you? Do you preach the scriptures, young man? I do. Good. I'll be there. Seven o'clock. We'll be looking for you. Mr. Pratt, are your views of the scriptures broad enough to accept such things as visions and the ministering of angels? They are. Come, sit. What is it, Isaac? Last week, I came across a book, a strange book, published down in Palmyra, said to have been originally written on plates of brass or gold by a branch of the tribes of Israel, and discovered and translated by a young man by the aid of heaven. There's even been talk of the ministering of angels. This book, do you have one? Loaned it to my sister. She'll be returning it in the morning, though, if you care to stop by. I will, if it's agreeable. I felt a strange interest in that book. The next morning, I called at his house where for the first time my eyes beheld the Book of Mormon. That book of books. The door's open. It's there on the table. Help yourself. I opened it with eagerness and read its title page.
then read the testimony of several witnesses in relation to the manner of its being found and translated. I commenced its contents by course. I read all day. Care for some supper, Mr. Pratt? Eating was a burden. I had no desire for food. Sleep was a burden when the night came, for I preferred reading to sleep. As I read, the Spirit of the Lord was upon me, and I knew and comprehended that the book was true. As plainly and manifestly as a man comprehends and knows that he exists. Do you know what's in this book? I haven't been able to hold on to it long enough to find out. I don't know how to thank you. My joy was now full. And I rejoiced sufficiently to more than pay me for all the sorrows, sacrifices, and toils of my life. I'm on my way to Palmyra. My book. I soon determined to see the young man who had been the instrument of its discovery and translation. I accordingly visited the village of Palmyra and inquired for the residence of a Mr. Joseph Smith. Thank you very much. I found it some two or three miles from the village, near the close of day. Evening. Howdy. I'm looking for Mr. Joseph Smith, translator of the Book of Mormon. Well, he lives in Pennsylvania now. It's about 100 miles from here. I'd be pleased to speak with his father or any member of the family. Well, his father's away on a journey right now, but this is his home, and I'm his brother. Pleased to meet you. My name is Pratt, Farley Pratt. Mr. Pratt, Hiram Smith. I informed him of the interest I felt in the book and of my desire to learn more about it. He welcomed me to his house. And since neither of us felt disposed to sleep, we conversed most of the night. His kingdom should be conducted in the last days. These meetings took place every year for four years until finally when he was sufficiently prepared, the Lord entrusted him with the plates. Joseph said that a messenger descended When did this happen? Fifteenth uh, of May, to be exact. This is a new dispensation, Mr. Pratt. A new commission. Angels have visited the earth. Authority has been restored. And Israel is being gathered a final time in preparation for the second coming of the Lord. How far to your next appointment? About 30 miles. But I'll return when it's finished. Well, please do. We'll be glad to have you. Uh, could you use this? Please, take it. It's a token of our friendship. Thank you. Have a safe trip. I traveled on a few miles, and stopping to rest, I commenced again to read the book. To my great joy, I found that Jesus Christ, in his glorified, resurrected body, had appeared to the ancient inhabitants of the American continent, that he had taught them his gospel and healed their sick, and that many of his teachings had been preserved here, in this book, 
in purity. I esteemed this book, or the information contained in it, more than all the riches of the world. Yes, I verily believe that I would not at that time have exchanged the knowledge I then possessed for a legal title to all the beautiful farms, houses, villages, and property which passed in review before me on my journey through one of the most flourishing settlements of western New York. Such was the Book of Mormon. Let us take the Book of Mormon, which a man took and hid in his field, securing it by his faith, to spring up in the last days. Let us behold it coming forth out of the ground, branching forth, yea, even towering with lofty branches and godlike majesty. It is truth, and it has sprouted and come forth out of the earth, and God is sending down his powers, gifts, and angels to lodge in the branches thereof. In another time, in another corner of the world, another soul is reached by the influence of the Book of Mormon. This is the true story of Vincenzo di Francesca. churches who engaged me as a teacher to serve members of his congregation. The Savior has said, he was so impressed with my gift in reading the scriptures that he suggested I attend Knox College in New York City. I followed his advice and received my degree as pastor with honors in November 1909. A 
As I think back over the events of my life leading up to a cold morning in February 1910, I cannot escape the feeling that God had been mindful of my existence. A story. Pastore! Emilio. Uh, to me. The signore, he is here. He asked that you come to his hall. He has some matters to discuss uh, about the parish. my money in here so you can keep your hands warm. Why so early, Vincenzo? Reverendo is ill. I go to his house to cheer him up, see if I can help. Beato say to. I'm grateful for your help during my illness. At the parish house, I gave some words of comfort to Reverend Scarillo and agreed to the services he requested of me during his illness. As I walked back to my own lodgings, my mind dwelt on the book in my hand and the strange names I had seen on its pages. Sì. E che altro? 
I'm pull the coat on me. insomuch that they were confounded, and they did go forth with me, and we did work timbers of curious workmanship. And the Lord did show me from time to time after what manner I should build the ship. Now I, Nephi, did not build the ship after the manner of men. But I did build it after the manner which the Lord had shown unto me. After I had finished the ship, according to the word of the Lord, my father and brethren beheld that it was good, and that the workmanship thereof was exceedingly fine. Wherefore, my brethren did humble themselves again before the Lord. And it came to pass that the voice of the Lord came unto my father that we should arise and go down into the ship. And it came to pass that they went in search of the flocks, and they did follow Ammon, and they rushed forth with much swiftness, and did head the flocks of the king, and did gather them together again to the place of water. Rabana, the king desires thee to stay. What desirest thou? Believest thou that there is a God? I do not know what that means. Believest thou in a great spirit? This is God. Art thou sent from God? I am a man. 
But I am called by his Holy Spirit to teach these things unto this people. And a portion of his Spirit dwells in me, which gives me knowledge and also power. Now when Ammon had said these words, he began at the creation of the world and laid before them the holy scriptures. But this is not all, for he expounded unto them the plan of redemption, which was prepared from the foundation of the world. And he also made known unto them concerning the coming of Christ. And the king believed all his words. testified shall come into the world. Come forth, that ye may thrust your hands into my side, that ye may feel the prints of the nails in my hands and in my feet, that ye may know that I am the God of Israel and the God of the whole earth, and have been slain for the sins of the world. Next day, I locked my door, and after reviewing the tenth chapter of Moroni, I knelt with the book in my hand. I then asked the Eternal Father, in the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, to tell me if the book was of God. As I prayed, I felt my body becoming cold. Then my heart began to pound as if it would speak, and a feeling of warmth and gladness came over me and filled me with such joy that I cannot find words to express. I knew that the book came from God. How, then, does one best serve God? Through hollow ritual and the recital of road to prayers? Near the end of his life, an ancient prophet and king gave the answer, the key as to how one can best serve God. These are his words. And behold, I tell you these things, that ye may learn wisdom, that ye may learn that when ye are in the service of your fellow beings, ye are only in the service of your God. Serving, helping one another, Angelo, where is that scripture found? It's in the Old Testament. 
somewhere. And it came to pass that I saw the heavens open, and an angel came down and stood before me. And he said unto me, What beholdest thou? And I said unto him, A virgin, most beautiful and fair above all other virgins. And the angel spoke to him again, saying, Behold, the virgin whom thou seest is the mother of the Son of God, after the manner of the flesh. Six hundred years before the birth of Christ, a prophet in a remote corner of the world was receiving detailed information concerning his birth, his life, his mission. Such was the vast importance of the coming of the Savior into the world. di Francesca Pastore Vincenzo di Francesca has been ordered before the committee of censure on this the third day of January 1912 to answer charges of heretical preaching and the promotion of disharmony among the pastoral brotherhood it has been a... Vincenzo, they tell me you have a book from which you are preaching new doctrine. I have, Reverendo. And what is the name of this book? Its name had long since been worn from the cover when I found it, and the title page was missing. I do not know the name of it. No matter. The book has been a source of trouble and disharmony to the Brotherhood. The attendance at your colleagues' sermons has been dwindling. Well, I could hardly find a seat at your service last week. Such sensationalism and inequality is disruptive to the peace of the Brotherhood. Quite so, Vincenzo. The Council is determined that for the good of the Brotherhood, and for your good, you must burn the book. I find the book precisely in harmony with the writings of the prophets. Its words testify that the book is of the God whom we profess to adore. It speaks of the appearance of our Redeemer after his crucifixion to a remote people organized into a nation upon this continent. And the Savior himself there organized a church with apostles and priesthood just like he had done during his ministry among the Jews. It is better, rather than burning the book, that we practice what is in it, because certainly it gives us more light and knowledge than we now have. Vincenzo, I cannot burn the book, because I fear God. I have asked him if it is true, and my prayers have been answered affirmatively. Positively, without a shade of doubt. I feel it in my whole heart, mind, and body at this instant. That book which oppresses you must be burned, or you will incur the most serious displeasure. I repeat, I will not burn the book. I prefer to go out of the ministry rather than burn the book. In April of 1914, this heavy conflict had its conclusion before the Council of Peace of the Sect, and I was invited to a conciliation. In 
Vincenzo. Please, sit down. When this matter was previously heard, there were sharp words from the committee members, which may have provoked you. But this is most regrettable. So today we seek a reconciliation. We all have a great love for you, Vincenzo, and are mindful of the valuable assistance you've always given us so freely. However, you must remember that obedience, complete and absolute, is the rule. You have continued to preach falsehoods, but now the long suffering of our members has come to an end. You must burn the book. Musicians have changed. The music is still the same. That I must destroy the book with fire without anyone examining its contents. I would be pleased, my brothers, if you would read it, pray about it, as I have done. You must be noble. Noble enough to destroy this vessel of falsehoods, which has brought so much bitterness to our fold. I look forward with joy to the time when the church to which the book belongs will be made known to me. And I will become a member of it. Vincenzo, repent of your stubbornness. If I burn this book, I will offend God. Vincenzo di Francesca, having attempted reconciliation and finding you unwilling to abide by the order of this council, we declare your credentials invalid and strip you of your degree of pastor and of every right and privilege in the church. You are hereafter classed as a rebel against the ordinances of the sect and are removed from the body of the church. The matter is closed. Despite the painful separation, I left with a feeling of peace at having defended my cause and that of the book of the unknown name. On November 26, 1914, the Italian consulate of New York called me to embark for Italy as a soldier in the 127th Infantry, stationed at Florence. In May 1915, I was sent to the front. There, I experienced all of the sadness and suffering associated with the battles of World War I. But I remembered the lessons of the book I had read. Men who were fighting like ourselves. It is told by a prophet named Alma. Di Francesca, the chaplain tells me you have an unusual loyalty to a book with no name. What is this book? I found it five years ago in the New York City. Who published it? I do not know. Tell me the story you related to the men the other night. In the commissary? It is an experience recorded by a prophet, Alma, in the 24th chapter of his works. Many centuries ago, on the American continent, a kingdom of bloodthirsty warriors underwent a miraculous change of heart. They were converted to the gospel of Jesus Christ, 
ever after they refused to take up arms against their attackers. In fact, they buried their weapons deep in the earth. Rather than shed the blood of their brethren, they would give up their own lives. When their attackers saw this, that they would not flee, but would lie down and perish, praising God in the very act, their hearts were touched, and they threw down their weapons. And that day the people of God were joined by more than a thousand souls. Do you intend to keep this book? I do. Ten days confinement, with the order that you speak no more of this nameless book and its stories. After the war, I returned to New York City, where I met an old friend who was a pastor of my former church and who knew the history of my troubles. He felt I had been unfairly dealt with, and he began interceding for me with members of the synod. I was finally admitted to the congregation as a lay member. As an experiment, it was agreed that I should accompany my pastor friend on a mission to Australia. In Sydney, we met some Italian immigrants who had serious questions about certain gospel translations in various editions of the Bible. My minister friend was unable to satisfy them and referred them to me. I understand your concerns. There are errors in translation, but through the grace of God, there are other sources, in addition to the Bible, from which we can learn the words of the Savior. Other sources? Verse 16. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Who are these other sheep? Shortly after the Savior's resurrection and ascension in the Eastern Hemisphere, he appeared in the Western Hemisphere to the inhabitants of the ancient Americas. But where have you learned of this? I have a book which contains the words the Savior preached to these people. He healed their sick, performed miracles, preached his gospel exactly as he had done in the Palestine. This knowledge was sweet the for them, the which the Savior preached to these but very bitter for my colleague. A deeper understanding of At first, he bore with me, but I could not resist the strong urge to preach the divine truth. And finally, he denounced me in his report. Again, the Synod put in force their previous judgment, and I was forever out of the sect. Soon after, I returned to Italy. In May 1930, while seeking for some information in a French dictionary, I stumbled onto the source of my precious book. I read the words carefully and found that a Mormon church had been established in 1830 and that this church operated a university at Provo, Utah. I quickly wrote to the president of the university and asked for information about the remainder of the book, The Talks of Nephi, Alma, and Mosiah. 
He passed my letter to the President of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And in another month, I heard from President Hebert J. Grant. He sent me a copy of the Book of Mormon in Italian and said that he had informed the President of the European Missions in Liverpool, England, Elder John A. Whitsell, to arrange baptism. June 5th, 1932, Elder John A. Whitsaw of the Council of the Twelve came to Naples intending to baptize me for the revolution between factions on the island of Sicily caused the police of Palermo to prevent me from going to Naples. And I had to wait for another chance, like Moses, in anticipation of the promised land. I was called to arms during the Italian-Ethiopian War in 1934, and this further prevented anyone with authority from reaching me for baptism. After the war, my name was placed on the mailing list of the Millennial Star, and in 1937 I started correspondence with President Hugh B. Brown of the British Mission. He wrote to me saying that he would be in Rome on a certain day, and I could meet him there and be baptized. However, his letter of invitation for me to go to Rome was delayed until the day in which he left for America because of the outbreak of World War II. At that time, all missionaries in Europe returned to America. Thus, I was deprived of baptism and cut off from any news of the church. I remained a faithful follower and fervent preacher of the gospel of this dispensation. I had the copies of the standard works, and I translated chapters into Italian and sent them to persons of my acquaintance. Dear Elder Winslow, my purpose in writing is to ask you to please help me to be baptized soon. My greatest desire is to receive this essential ordinance from an authorized servant of God. Elder Witzel answered, saying that he had asked President Samuel E. Bringhurst of the Swiss-Austrian mission to come down to Sicily and baptize me. Vincenzo 
Alfonso di Francesca. Having been commissioned of Jesus Christ, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen.